Man, Crow has a great right cross. I am Lux. <laughs> and I'm Ember. Oof, poor Oscar. Yeah, though I do think Ruby is right. I think she is, but Crow is kind of at a new low point here. As you can tell, this is our thoughts on Ruby, Volume 6, Episodes 3 and 4. I thought I'd try mixing up the intro was a little bit, especially since I don't have been too much puppet work on these particular recordings, is just take the drawing, make a thumbnail, put it at the front. Time lapse. Well, technically, you could use our avatars for all the videos. Yes, I could, but this supposedly also gives me time to do other things. Still waiting on that. Yes. Ah, but on to the two wonderful episodes we have here. The story of Salem and Ozpin, or Ozma. And thank God it's not the jilted lover. Oh yeah, I really, well, you listened to the last recording, right? <laughs> we didn't want that. Though I can't wait till someone in the group realizes the question Ozpin should have asked. The question isn't how do you destroy her? There are two variations that we both believe would work. How do you redeem Salem? And... How do you stop Salem's plans? Or how do you save humanity? Well, there's a third one there. Oh, it's just like, well, stopping her and destroying her kind of go a little bit along the same lines in theory. So it's like, no, no, the real question is how do you save humanity? Because that's what you're trying to do by keeping her away from the relics. You're trying to keep the gods from coming back because humanity is not a good place to be judged in the world of Remnant. Ooh, yeah, in no way. And humanity in my opinion, includes the Faunus. But here's an interesting thing. After we actually watched one of the episodes again, and on the second viewing of it, I realized that they, the Jin didn't say mankind. She said men. I don't know if she's using it in the general term or if she's specifically saying men are easily swayed. This is why we have a group of girls saving the world. Well, the hearts of men are easily swayed. The first time she says that, she means it in the more general sense. But the second time, when Ozma's being swayed by Salem, she means it specifically that men are easily swayed. When the love of your life is asking you to do something, after you've been reunited, after death, I mean, come on, that's hard to say no to. Yeah, I do find it kind of interesting that it was also Ozpin, or Ozma, that the god of light chose to bring back to help either save humanity or... I think that inherently means that the god of light thinks that humanity can be saved. Well, everything we see in the beginning of the story says that Ozma was a righteous warrior, a pillar of light and goodness. He wasn't braving the tower because he wanted the maiden's hand. He was braving the tower for the sake of fighting injustice. Hmm. A crazy idea just hit me. Maybe it's not humanity as a whole that he has to save. He doesn't have to change everyone. But if he can prove that he can change the one soul that the gods themselves could not change. Yes, if he can save Salem. <laughs> Because that's what doomed humanity is, just one person. Salem tricked the Lord of Darkness into bringing Ozma back. And so they cursed her with immortality. And then she used that immortality to attack them and basically doom the rest of humanity. I read some stuff online about the first episode after we watched it. Some people were confused about like, okay, so humanity was gone. But when Ozma came back, there were lots of humans. People were like, so how did that happen? I'm like, well, if you listen to the God of Light, he says humanity will eventually return. He didn't say when he was going to bring Ozma back. And he said that they were in a place between worlds. Those tend to be timeless. Also, the God of Light, it's in his name. He's a god. So there's no point in sending Ozma back before humanity has risen again because they're not giving him immortality they're giving him reincarnation 
So even if they brought him back in his original body, he couldn't reincarnate until humanity rose again. There wouldn't be any sentient creatures for him to reincarnate into based on what we've seen of the world so far. Because humanity had to be there first before he could reincarnate. So the god said, I'm going to bring you back. Humanity will eventually return to the world. And that was the god saying, when humanity returns to the world, if you agree, I'm going to put you there. And in such a way that you will never be alone. Because I think the god wants him to have someone to counter his own views, to give him an outside view of what's going on. Someone who's actually living a different life than his. Because Salem, in her immortality, has lost touch with humanity. And you can tell she's definitely perceiving herself as a god still. Very much so. But the question now is, what is her final desire? Does she want to get all the relics back and have humanity judged and the entire world destroyed so that she can finally die? Or does she want the gods to come back so that she can challenge them? Or does she actually want to keep the relics separate? but she just wants them under her control so she can wield their powers. Hmm. That's a bunch of theories, and I only thought of one of them. Specifically the theory of her wanting to summon the gods to either confront them or destroy humanity because the humanity gets judged. But another one was her summoning them because she wanted something else. I'm trying to remember. She wanted to maybe try to, maybe she would actually want to try to destroy them. Maybe because she's learned more of how to destroy them. So she wants to call them back and do that. But it's interesting. Like now I'm like wondering. So, so who? Because I don't think it will be Ozpin that's going to change Salem's heart. No, no. This is all going to be Ruby. It's either going to be Ruby or Ruby. What I mean by that is it's either going to be the singular Ruby or team Ruby. Either way. Hmm. I mentioned this before after we watched that episode. Team Ruby is actually a good example of what the gods wanted. Well, at least the god of light. Because the god of darkness wanted destruction. But it was the god of light who proposed the truce that they create one final entity together that has the ability to choose between light and dark. But with what we see the god of light say to Ozma. It sounds more like he wants humanity on the path of light, but it sounds like the artifacts will call back both gods. So if humanity is on the path of light, isn't the god of darkness going to be ticked? Because the point was that they have choice, and what made the god of darkness upset was that his own gifts were being used against him, and that... Their creations were still demanding from their creators. Not asking, but demanding. And I find it interesting that Salem also kept saying, correct this. This is a problem. This isn't right. This is unfair. No. <laughs> Death is not unfair. It's just a natural thing that happens. Sometimes we perceive it as coming too early, but who knows? Just because someone is young and dies doesn't mean that that was too early. But looking at it from a human standpoint, she finally got free of the tower. She found something that she cared about more than her own freedom. She cared about the person who gave her that freedom. Also, they play around with the word freedom a lot in that flashback, as it were. Because I think she loses her freedom a lot on her own. She causes her own loss of freedom. Through her obsessions. So she is a slave to those obsessions. The very thing that she calls Cinder on. Hmm. And speaking of a Cinder, there's something else we've noticed in the intro that we didn't catch the first couple of times. Torchwick's hat flies by. And both me and Nimber are like, we want Torchwick back. But based on how things are, it might mean and probably does that we're getting Neapolitan. Quite. Though I'm still interested to find out who we see fighting in the shadows. I actually have a theory about that because I paid attention more attention to the shape of the person who's fighting in the shadows, and I actually think that's Cinder. 
based on the hood and the outfit and the shape of the body and comparing that to Cinder and the current robe and everything, I think that shadow shot is actually Cinder. It might be. Based on the overall feel of it, I was also thinking Ilea, even though she's going back with the Faunus. But Adam's also back with the Faunus, so we do have some action occurring there. And that reminds me of another thing in the intro that you went, oh, it's interesting that a healthy Salem is looking up at the statue healthy, well, more pure. Before she plunged herself into the Dark Lord's pool. Looking up at the statue of Oz, Ozma. Or at least his first reincarnation. So I'm thinking this also shows that she really looked up to him, probably because of the whole you rescued me thing. There, there's a name for that syndrome. Just can't think of it off the top of my head. Whatever has to do with something maiden. Also, maidens? Going back to this informative episode, the children will eventually be the spirits of the four maidens. Because we see four daughters born to Salem and Ozma. Four daughters who were likely killed during that horrific battle. And Ozma's power is both magic and reincarnation. And the tale of the Four Maidens itself, as it was told to us, can still be true with all of that. Because with Ozma's reincarnation ability, but it's not the pure spirits of the maidens, it's the power of the maidens that gets transferred. Because, you know, things don't always pass down exactly from generation to generation. And we see that Ozpin slash Ozma, through his incarnations, goes through many where he falls into despair and tries to forget all about it. So he could be that lonely magician in the woods who's completely given up. And then these reincarnations of his daughter's powers come to him. And because that far back, he would still have the ability to grant powers. He could still do something and give them a boon like he does in the story. I'm also waiting for them to give a nice backstory or tale of where the silver-eyed maidens come from. Because that still hasn't been answered yet. We've gotten the general idea of like, oh, silver-eyed maidens are special, but we don't know where they came from we don't know when they first appeared we don't know if it's only among humans i don't think it's only women though i believe when it was first brought up when we got the little explanation that we did that it's silver-eyed people and i believe when salem's generals were talking about it because one specifically says we've dealt with the silver-eyed i believe they said people before silver-eyed people we didn't Go back and rewatch that section. I wanted to rewatch the story of humanity's creation between the light and dark brother because it tied back into this very informative backstory episode. And I like the designs of the two gods when they're transformed. The dragons? Mm hmm. Which I think is their actual true form compared to um, the human forms that they take on, which I think are there to. As usual, we don't want to, like, scare the person we're talking to. We want them to be in awe, not... Ah. It also interesting that they both have horns. I believe in some pagan religions, there is a horned god specifically referenced as the horned god. Entirely different from Satanism and more occult paths. <laughs> also, what's kind of interesting is that two different horn types the destruction god had more of the curly horns the ram horns and the um light god had more deer or more of antlers rather than horns mm -hmm. also the way the dark god moves when he comes out of the pool to answer salem reminds me so much of the villain from fern gully even though it's more mm. jerky in the motions it just very much reminds me of that very wow uh tim curry character in a highly environmentalist 90s pegged children's film i still enjoyed it but you know so much of the 90s it was either extreme or save the environment or extreme extremely saving the environment true but back to this and going back to the silver eyes real quick i didn't pay much attention to it but, like, maybe I should watch one portion of that third episode again 
to see what color eyes the kids have. The only one I remember is green. Yeah, because like, I'm like, I wonder if one of them was a silver-eyed maiden. Mm. Going to be interesting because like, that's going to be important. And it may be explained in this season through the lady that you suspect has silver eyes. Well, there's so much to hint at it because we get a close-up of her face and her eyes blinking before we cut to a close-up of Ruby's face in the intro. Mm -hmm. And that just reminded me of another part of the intro that I kind of slightly connected back to um, something I forgot about, Salem. The scene where Ruby is fighting a bunch of hands coming out of the darkness. We saw those in the next episode being made by Salem, or controlled by Salem. So that either means Ruby ends up where Salem's castle is in some weird fashion this season, or Salem actually goes out to probably go Ozpin. Or third option, it's metaphorical for Ruby is now the direct force going against Salem because Ozpin has withdrawn. It could also symbolize that Ruby has gone off on her own to try to get Crow back. Because we see those same hands drawing Crow down and then we see Ruby fighting them. Hmm. And I think that may also be a metaphor for depression. Very much so, because they included the bottle, and we see in episode four that Crow now thinks his life has no meaning. Which, thankfully, his nieces are there, because family still has to matter to him. Even if his life no longer has a purpose, he is not going to let something happen to those girls. And I still don't think what he has is a curse, just everyone looks at it that way. Bad things do happen, but bad things, crazy enough, can lead to good things. He just needs to figure out what those good things are. Like, Ozpin is not bad luck. You met Ozpin, that's actually good luck. Because Ozpin is, really is a good person, but he needs outside perspective to figure out other ways to solve this. He's so focused on how he thinks that he can try to solve it. But I don't think he's ever asked anyone because he's never trusted anyone to give the full secret to. So no one else has been able to ruminate on it. So this group of is that seven people now have not necessarily the full story, but they have more than any of the predecessors have. And probably all of which Ozpin could have told. Osbin couldn't have told all of Salem's part. Yeah, unless he got that along with some other questions he may have asked in the past from. Though I don't know if that's the case, why hasn't he figured out that it's probably better to ask, how do I redeem? How do I save? Because there's other ways to get rid of her. How do you dispel the darkness? How do you temper that anger? And that desire. Because literally, she can only die once she learns the importance of life and death. So, technically, Osbin can't destroy her. And that's the question he asked. That's the trick to this genie. She specifically answers your question. So you have to make sure your question is actually the question you want asked. It can't be a generalized question. Because she will take it to its literal meaning. Like, how do I destroy Salem? That's what you asked. That's the answer you got. Now, if you would have said, how do I save humanity? Then you would have gotten a different answer. Something that would actually be actionable. We're working under the premise that humanity is savable. Because the god of light thought so. Because he gave humanity a second chance. And I think, the, I think both gods think... That way, because I have a feeling the Dark God had to be involved to create more humans on the planet again, because he said they would come back. But I think the God of Light specifically came to Ozma because he's the God of more creating things. So he was the one who would create Ozpin, Ozma, again and again and again. And would create the relics. Which I think were actually named or referred to as different things in the part we watched 
the creation of humanity. I think they were called different things. I know some of them were the same, like creation and destruction and uh, knowledge. Yeah, so wisdom, knowledge, and the last one was choice. Yeah, I think that's different in um, the current episodes, because I think they changed the name of one of them, because I was like, that sounds different. Something about the way they said those sounds different, so. So it could be different. Also, what Crow was telling was a legend, as handed to him by Osben. Hmm. Osben himself could have either misremembered or mistold the names of the four relics mm. in order to protect them. Ah, yeah. Gotcha. And I have a feeling all four relics are definitely going to come into play at some point. They may not come together in any of the seasons we see until like the very final season. And it may not be like a big battle or anything. Because I have a feeling the big battle is going to happen. The relics aren't going to be, well, not all of them will be involved. But the big catch is going to be Salem getting redeemed in some way and either that's when the relics will come together or it will actually be in the after credits like after all this is done and Salem's uh I almost said resurrected but that doesn't work uh humanity is restored she is turned back to at least understanding what's going on I'm thinking that in and of itself may actually summon the gods, too. You would think. Also, I'm curious what the gods have been up to in the meantime. Because they said they were going to learn from this failure. Did they go start another world? Or are they actually watching this entire time? Which they could be. And they're just staying out of it until the relics are coming together. Because that's like, that's our signal to go back, brother. Do we have to? Only if they get them together. <laughs> okay. Um, your move on the chess table, by the way. <laughs> oh. Uh, checkmate. Uh, no, I can actually still move my king. Oh, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Your move. <laughs> also interesting that the moon was destroyed by the leaving of the Dark Brother. And that explains why they really showed the moon being destroyed in the intro as well. There's a lot of stuff in that intro that's really interesting. Another thing like I was thinking about with the intro is the whole, why is the train the, like the main focus, the main point they always come back to in this particular intro? Because they usually, the places they show the people fighting is usually very important and references something later in the series. So, several options there. One, it could be metaphorical, that they're on the move a lot and fighting. There could also be another train ride later. Or this could be extremely metaphorical in that it's showing the splitting of the group again, which sets the tenor for the season, because in the very beginning, we split Ruby and Juniper. And we still haven't actually seen that scene where Jean pins Oscar to the wall. Well, they have to reconnect with Juniper before that happens, unless has already happened, and we'll see it in flashback. Because it looks like it was in the same apartment or place they were staying in that city. Also, something else that we kind of talked about in our previous episode was how we thought Yang would react. She was angry, but she didn't seem to like trust him less. She was just like, Angry that, why didn't you tell us all of this? This was important information. We could have done something with this. Yeah, I didn't think about that as I was saying that <laughs> but right at the end. But she was angry about that. She wasn't distrusting of him anymore She because she always was. She didn't get less from it. But what she was now is she, like, she actually understood because I think everyone did see the same thing and they did interpret it very similarly. So she's actually more angry at the fact that you could have told us this. It would have been okay. And that's what she's angry about. And basically Crow is reacting like I expected Yang to react. Because yeah. it would have really hurt with her mechanical arm. Especially with how strong she is. And I didn't even think about Crow's reaction that much. I thought a little bit of how he reacted. But I didn't think he would go down that particular route. Well... It wasn't the vision that put him there. It was Osmond's final answer. I don't have a plan to defeat her. Which means, in Crow's mind, that everything he's done to try and help Osmond 
has been for nothing because they don't have a plan. They don't have a way that they're going to stop Salem. Everything's just a holding pattern, and eventually they lose. That's a, another thing, too. I, I also just remembered that every time Ozpin or Ozma reincarnates, he loses more power. So with each successive generation, his magical ability diminishes. Eventually, he will have no magic at all. If that's what the gods are allowing, then obviously magic isn't the answer. And that may be a built-in timer as well. Meaning, like, you're going to run out of this ability, so use it wisely while you have it kind of thing. But it means that in each successive incarnation, he feels himself less capable. Because in each one, by his mind, he becomes weaker. Mm. I don't know if I mentioned it. I think I did. That Ruby was right that he is his own person. That Oscar is his own person. But Crow's immediate negativity of don't lie to him, Ruby, you're better than that. She's not lying. She's stating what she believes. If she is ultimately wrong, she is wrong. But she is stating what she believes. Yep, and I believe that too. I believe that Oscar is his own person. I think that's going to be a big key, especially since Ozpin locked himself away. So it's going to be more Oscar. And it's interesting how much Oscar has been fighting Ozpin because we see in the flashback that Ozma slash Ozpin eventually learned to live with the souls he is reincarnated with. Because that was before it was more of a hostile takeover. <laughs> And I'm not quite sure. I was a little confused by the first reincarnation, too, when he first appeared. Because it sounded like Ozpin didn't actually know who he was. He didn't remember. Mm. So I think the memory came flooding back later. Mm. But in that first instance, he truly didn't know. Either that or we were seeing confusion as... Because we see Ozma take over the body and save the warrior, but was Ozma still in control when the rescued person asked? Because mm -hmm. if it was back to the original soul, they would just be confused as all heck because what just happened? Good point. Anything you specifically want to go over right now? Because I realize I've been kind of leading the conversation. <laughs> I want to move on to Salem because I already reference this earlier in the episode that she was calling Cinder on her obsessions and desires and how that was her downfall. But then we see Salem's entirely unreasonable reaction to the return of Osbin. Which I don't think she expected so soon. No, because basically everyone was going, already? Because apparently he has a pattern of how long it takes him to come back. Well, I think it's not necessarily to come back because I think the reincarnation's immediate. But how quickly does that new incarnation get back in the game? And this, I believe, was very quickly. Because mm -hmm. everyone around still knows Ozpin. That's another thing that's popped into my head. I think Ozpin, like was said in the vision, usually takes time to get to know the individual before he goes back into the game. And he lives with them and has, lets them have their own lives. This time he kind of had to rush it because Salem was getting really close to certain things. So he knew he had to get back into the game almost immediately to prevent stuff he saw happening. So one, it was a rush job because the villain team is telling us this is quick. And two, we can tell it's a rush job just from observation because Osmond and Oscar are still switching back a lot. Well, up till now that he's run away and is pouting. I think it's because he, he finally got a really big emotional slap in the face and all of his secrets were kind of like dumped out in front of him and he was probably reconfronted with all of that because he was watching through Oscar. Because Ozpin was crying. It wasn't Oscar, it was Ozpin. And I have a feeling it's going to be Ruby or Oscar who gets Ozpin to come back out is going to be a combination thereof because Ruby can speak to both of them, but it's Oscar who, dwelling in the same body, is going to be able to reach down to 
where he's locked himself in and open the door to the room of his soul. Hmm. How Yu-Gi-Oh of you. Well, it's kind of Yu-Gi-Oh. Two souls, one body. Ah. I was suddenly remembering a clip from Yu-Gi-Oh abridged. There, there's this scene where Yugi sets up a um, day with Taya and switches out the souls so the pharaoh is now in charge. And the pharaoh's like, God, gosh darn it, Yugi! What the? And the Yugi bridge clip, he's cussing up a store because all it is is bleeps. And I just remember that and it was hilarious. And I thought of that because of the whole, oh yeah, two, bo- two souls, one body. Hmm. Also fun to go back to both canon Ruby and Ruby Chibi because both series reference the book about a man with two souls. Interesting. I wonder who published that book. Could it be Ozpin? Or could it actually be someone who actually knew Ozpin? Or observed one of his incarnations or got the idea based on some interaction with Ozpin at some point in their lives. It could be like even more removed. Like someone who interacted with Ozpin told someone else about it, and that person told someone else about it, and that, that person took it and went, well, that's a good idea for a story. Anything else you'd want to really dig into? Emerald's terrified expressions? Yeah, Emerald is really taking all of this hard. The happiest moment for her was like, oh, she's still alive? That was the best moment for her, but she was still terrified the entire time. I also like the um guy with the mustache going, how does she know? Dude. <laughs> it's not that you questioned her it was the fact that you had that question she has like a lot of powers you don't understand so why would that question pop into your head at this particular moment because she's observed stuff that you do so i think the question would be more of how did she manage to survive rather than questioning how could you possibly know that you guys are allied with Salem because she's powerful and has made promises. So why are you questioning that power? Though I do think it shows a flaw, as it were, in his character. Because I think unlike some of the others, he doesn't see her as a godlike figure. No, he just sees her as extremely powerful. It's the Scorpion Faunus who sees her as a goddess. Or a great queen, and I think... The other guy? He says goddess. He says both. No. That's why I said or. And I think the big guy who like stabs dust into his arms. I don't think he sees her as a goddess-like figure either. But I do think he sees her. I'm trying to figure out specifically how. I'm trying to phrase what I'm thinking. is like he doesn't revere her. He's not scared of her. And he doesn't like look up to her power like the guy with the mustache does. I think he sees her as a means to an end because I think he's a good person naturally, but he sees her as a way to fix whatever problem Ozpin caused. What do you mean whatever problem Ozpin caused? He blames Ozpin for the death of his sister. Yes, I was just simplifying (laughs) it. I remember that that happened. Because he doesn't believe in a necessary death. How many times do we see him say... You didn't have to do this. No one had to die here. And he even helps Oscar before he knows that he's also Ozpin. You know, and we get a look into his character at that point because it's don't let small obstacles stand in the way of your goals. So he allows other things that he wouldn't normally allow because those sacrifices of morals and actions are on the path to his greater goal. Which I'm not quite sure. I don't know if it's either he wants to correct what Ospin did. Like she, he sees that maybe she can bring her back to life. Or if it's just making Ospin pay so that no one else is sacrificed. Because we still don't know exactly what Salem has promised them individually. We just know there has to be something. So many interesting things. Especially like that info dump episode. Or exposition dump episode combined with us watching the intro more and having the information from that exposition dump episode. It fills in a lot of stuff and gives us a little bit more perspective on what's going on in the intro. It almost feels like there's a lot more given away in this intro than previous intros. Or we just got really good at looking at the intros and going, aha. 
because this is the sixth intro they've done, and we've studied all of them. Some more than others. Okay, any last things to go over before we wrap this up? She's shaking her head, ladies and gentlemen, so that means... And this has been Our Thoughts on Ruby, Volume 6, Episodes 3 and 4. Ooh, you guys made it to the outro again? Did you just skip past everything so you could see the completed drawing? It's okay, I've skipped through other people's videos on occasion. Just don't make a habit of it. So, the usual. Like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell. I don't know why they did that. Watch other videos, share these with your friends, relatives, you know, uh, your frenemies, your enemies. Hey, we'll, we'll take a view. <laughs> and if... You know, there are subcategories of videos. We have different uh, television and web series. We have some stuff on video games. We have an entirely, and now for something completely different, section, which is the Ember's Reading Room, where we go through children's books. Uh, some that belong to us and some that have belonged to others or have been recommended or provided by others. Thank you, Sasami Chan. I'm fan of the gourmet. Where we read through them. Sorry you don't get pictures of all the pages, but, you know, copyright, fair use. And we do some commentary and analysis, but we do read all the words in the book. So if you really want an audio version of the book, take it, you know, take out our voices and, oh, look, there's a whole audio book. Well, they couldn't completely take out your voice, otherwise they wouldn't have a book. <laughs> uh, true. Okay, now for the blatant cash grab, because... Everybody does. So we have four possibilities actually because commissions, you have a specific idea, you give Lux the parameters, you agree on a price, magic happens, and you get digital artwork. The ones where you don't give us money directly is when you click on our affiliate links. Some of our videos have links for purchasing products or signing up for free services where we get a little bit of a kickback. But you don't have to soil your hands by handing money to us directly. Now back to handing us money directly. So there's Patreon, which is all Lux. So it's all Lux all the time. There are drawings and drawings and polls for more drawings. Starts out at a dollar, more money, more drawings, also high res. And then there's coffee, which works in increments of $3. And if you check out Ember's Emporium of Everything, you'll see that that's actually more than the cost of a cup of coffee, if I'm the one buying. So give us a coffee and we can get more than a coffee with it. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.